Welcome to our special briefing on uh, cannabis federal scheduling reform. We're really excited to be here today, almost a, about a year from when um, President Biden initiated this process. And our firm has been working for over a decade to end cannabis prohibition. And it's pretty surreal to be here today discussing the historic and long overdue acknowledgement of the medical efficacy and safety of cannabis and the HHS recommendation to move it to schedule three, um, especially under a presidential directive to expeditiously right the, wrong, right the wrongs of the failed war on drugs. When we all started this work, it was almost um, non-existent that you would even get to have a federal conversation about cannabis. So um, truly remarkable process, progress and we're thrilled to share our insights and talk through the road ahead with, with you all, with the businesses and stakeholders that have been on the front lines of ending the war on drugs and shaping a responsible industry and surviving through the challenges of prohibition. Um, we've been working very closely on the scheduling reform effort as a proud member with the Coalition for Cannabis Scheduling Reform, who's done tremendous work in, um, you know, in informing the federal government of the, the law and the policy and the, the road to um, to rescheduling cannabis and, um, you know, getting the industry organized and uh, active around this effort. And, you know, we've helped guide strategy and um, contributed to the report that helped inform the scheduling process and are leading on a number of, of legal matters. And as we'll, we'll talk about, there's still a lot of work ahead and um, important and exciting work. So we're very encouraged about the positive progress and motivated for the work ahead and committed to working with um, the group and the industry in these critical next stages. So today we'll walk through the administrative process, um, share our insights on the implications for businesses, um, outline what the work ahead is, and then open up the floor for questions and discussions. Feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try and hit them at the end and we'll um, save all the questions for, for the end. We can go ahead. This is a little background on the on the firm. Um, but as I mentioned, we've been you know, working in uh, marijuana policy reform for over a decade and across the nation. You can keep going. So we're going to walk through, um, and each of my wonderful colleagues is going to hit one of these main points: what this means for the industry, the process and you know, various impacts on um, the industry operations. And you know, really, I can't emphasize enough the significance of, um, you can go to the next slide, the HHSS's recommendation, which was an acknowledgement of the medical efficacy and low potential of abuse for marijuana. And you know, this process was done through an administrative process initiated by President Biden both Congress and the president can change the status of a controlled substance um, through you know, different vehicles, but the process President Biden initiated requires um, a review by HHS of the, um, of the science and then a DEA review process that we'll go in, through in detail. But essentially about a year ago today, um, the president announced a three-step process to expeditiously review whether marijuana was appropriately scheduled and to you and the US's failed approach on marijuana by directing the HHS secretary um, and the attorney general to initiate the administrative review process to review whether cannabis belonged in schedule one, also to extend pardons to federal offenders convicted for simple possession and encourage governors to do the same. Um, he ordered that this process be expeditious. It usually is something that takes about nine years, um, but his goal was to conclude it, you know, prior to the next election, and um, you know, to to fulfill his promises to to right the wrongs. Um, as we'll talk about below, this type of agency action is subject to judicial review, as if challenged, and the agency decisions are also subject to applicable international uh, treaty obligations. So as all of you well know, um, marijuana absolutely doesn't belong in Schedule One, which is what the HHS finally concluded. Um, under the CSA, drugs are categorized by five schedules based upon their medical use and potential for abuse. 
with marijuana being classified with heroin and LSD as having no medical use and um, a high potential for abuse. And as the coalition's report well outlines, you know, that's there's substantial evidence in the 38 states that have legalized medical marijuana, all the, the patients and use and treatment and the many doctors across the country treating it as well as, you know, bodies of research supporting medical use and, um, you know, low potential for abuse, no deaths um, of marijuana, especially when regulated um, and subject to, you know, the, the regulations we've seen be effective in, in many states. Um, and this is what President Biden recognized too, that the, the federal law is, is outdated and, and completely inappropriate with respect to cannabis. And now HHS has recommended the same. So um, as I mentioned in August, for the first time in history, the federal government is acknowledging medical efficacy and safety and moving away from the failed war on drugs um, with the schedule three recommendation. And, you know, we'll discuss this is certainly incremental progress towards, you know, what is most appropriate for cannabis and criminal justice reform and descheduling and, you know, regulating, regulating cannabis responsibly, but, this is a huge shift in the regulation of cannabis and federal drug policy in general that um, is critical progress to that end goal and one of the biggest changes in, in decades, really. So I'm gonna um, turn it over here shortly to my, my colleagues, but there's a lot of information out there about what Schedule 3 would and wouldn't do and a lot of speculation. So we're really gonna go through what it means for um, the industry and what what the impact of Schedule 3 is. Um, this is the maximum achievable outcome we could have gotten from the administrative process, you know, given abuse potential and medical data and the, the legal standards that the agencies um, must comply with. But, you know, it, it wasn't the possible outcome that the administrative process was going to deschedule. But, you know, my opinion, the recognition of medical safety and efficacy and that Schedule 3 recommendation is going to be the congressional momentum um, to get to descheduling and the acknowledgement of medical use is just going to have tremendous impacts um, and move us in the right direction. Next slide. And, you know, it's also going to do a number of other things, including 280E, promoting research, um, as we'll talk about. It certainly doesn't change FDA enforcement priorities, and we'll go into detail about what this will mean for um, the state markets. So what are the next steps in the process? Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jason, who's gonna walk through where we are now and um, where DEA goes from here. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, so we are currently, as Sean mentioned, HHS submitted its recommendation to DEA already. It did so on August 29th of this year, um, acknowledging the medical efficacy of cannabis, as well as its low abuse potential, uh, recommending for it to be placed in Schedule 3. So now the CSA requires DEA to conduct its own analysis as to um, its understanding of uh, cannabis's potential for abuse. Um, it basically will look at three factors. There are actually eight that DEA uses, but these three are kind of encompass the eight. Um, so it, it'll focus on the same kind of questions that HHS um, looked at, except DEA must accept HHS's recommendation as far as the medical and scientific matters. So it'll be looking outside of that for abuse potentials, um, safety of, of marijuana. Uh, next slide. So during DEA's review, um, it's gonna review the relevant evidence that it has, um, HHS's evaluation, as well as its recommendation, and uh, whether there's substantial evidence that marijuana should be moved to schedule three. Um, if it determines that there is evidence, then it'll initiate proceedings, um, which I'll discuss in a minute. Uh, if not, it issues a order um, denying the scheduling requests and will publish the final order in the federal register. Uh, next slide. So if uh, the steps in the rescheduling process, it kind of just goes like this. So if DEA concludes that evidence supports placing marijuana in Schedule 3, it will initiate the rulemaking. 
Um, we believe this is most likely going to happen either way. Um, and I'll go over why in, in a few minutes. Um, but once initially, once they initiate rulemaking, then interested parties can submit a uh, comment. Um, during the comment period, a person with standing can also request a hearing. Um, it's an administrative hearing, runs much like a, a normal trial. Um, and this can actually extend the timeline that we'll ta also talk about, I believe, on the next slide. Uh, but this can extend the timeline beyond what we expect, because as everyone knows, hearings, you present evidence, you have witnesses. And so that kind of dictates uh, how long it'll go. And that's not a set timeline. Um, after the public comment period, and if there is a hearing, DEA will then issue a final rule. Um, this rule is based on the comments submitted. It does review them. Um, it, HHS's evaluation and DEA's own analysis, and it'll also review the record of any hearings that happen. Uh, once they do issue a final rule, DEA, or sorry, um, there is a 30-day period where uh, persons who believe that they're aggrieved by the scheduling decision can seek judicial review. And so it's not over once they make a final ruling. Um, they have to go through that process as well. Uh, yeah. So right now we're currently waiting on DEA's determination um, on HHS's re recommendation. Um, this generally takes anywhere from 30 to 90 days. Um, there really is no enforcement mechanism if it takes longer though, but historically it's fallen within that range. Um, right now, the 90 day window, if it goes to the, to the uh, longer end is at the end of November, um, which if a shutdown occurs, obviously it throws that into question, but we expect it, um, while there's no specific, um, while the timeline's uncertain, um, politically, we do believe that we're going to get a determination here pretty soon. Um, and then once they initiate the comment period, um, there's the 30 days to make comments. This can be extended to uh, 60 days um, if it's determined necessary. There are certain requirements for that. But if they believe that they need that extra time, they can extend the comment period to 60 days. And then the final rule, again, it's uncertain when we'll get a final rule, but um, there are some who believe it could be the end of this year. Um, I know the president, I'm sure the administration what would like it to happen before the end or before the next election cycle. But again, hearings, things like that make it a bit uncertain. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the expected conclusion here, um, it's not DEA has never ignored an HHS recommendation before, a scheduling recommendation before. So this would be historic if they decide to do it with marijuana. However, with marijuana, there has been a long history of DEA mandating that it must remain in Schedule 1 or 2, and then it cannot remove it from those schedules pursuant to the U.S.'s treaty obligations. So while we did mention that DEA is bound by HHS's scientific and medical findings, um, it does have a kind of escape hatch as far as treaty obligations go, um, because DEA is required to schedule uh, a substance pursuant to our obligations under the single convention. And so the single convention includes certain obligations. Some of them are like registration obligations, like any marijuana, even if it's moved to schedule three, um, the DEA will be required to register uh, marijuana operators under the single convention. Uh, there's also certain reporting requirements, quota requirements that the single convention um, mandates that the, the DEA will, will need to continue to comply with. Um, but like I mentioned, so DEA's policy since the 70s has been that it can't move it out of Schedule 1 or 2. This was confirmed by a court decision in 1977 where uh, the D.C. Circuit acknowledge that the DEA must account for our single convention obligations when scheduling marijuana. What is great though, is in 2018, the DEA rescheduled Epidiolex and they basically created a map of how they can reschedule marijuana now while still complying with the single convention. In 2018, Epidiolex, while a pharmaceutical product was still considered marijuana, this was pre the farm bill, the 2018 farm bill. And so what it did was it uh, rescheduled uh, Epidiolex into Schedule 5 and then added regulations to ensure it complied with the treaties. So it can do the same thing right now. It moves marijuana to Schedule 3 and then just adds regulations to ensure it complies with the treaty obligations. So as far as we're concerned, we don't believe the treaties are going to be uh, uh, too much of a hurdle for DEA to get past. 
um, but it is an avenue that they can do outside of HHS's recommendation. Thanks, Jason. So now we're gonna move into um, how does this impact businesses, particularly the, the, the state businesses. And I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie, who leads our corporate practice to talk about the impact on 280E and capital markets. Okay, uh, th thanks, Sean. So a lot of, lot of gonna be a lot of speculation in this slide. Um, so if you move to schedule three, uh, it solves 280E sort of instantly. Uh, because schedule two, two eighty E only applies to drug, you know, trafficking of substances or schedule one or schedule two. So the second it's schedule three officially, two eighty E is gone. I'm I'm not a tax lawyer, so you know, I, I don't want to get into how this will affect, uh, you know, a tax return in a year where it's bifurcated. I, I imagine you'd be subject to eighty E for a portion of the year and and not subject to two eighty for the the other half of the year post rescheduling. It's not going to change past tax liabilities, um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't count on that. Uh, but obviously, this will have a tremendous impact uh, to companies. Now, a lot of cannabis companies are not properly accounting for 280E and just racking up major bills with the IRS. So for those companies, it won't really put much to their bottom line initially because they weren't paying those taxes already. But it does solve the problem of sort of running up this bill with the IRS with no clear plan to pay. So, you know, to me, this is the um, the biggest challenge in the cannabis industry would sort of disappear overnight. Potential impact on capital markets. So the, I, I think one thing that you'll probably see is if it actually had, you know, when it happens, you'll see a huge bump in stock prices. Now, will that get built into stock prices ahead of time? I think probably, but, you know, there's it, it just dramatically improves the financial the, the financial situation of all the publicly traded MSOs because, um, you know, these companies are being valued based on the you know the expectation of future cash flow, and this dramatically improves your expectations of future cash flow because you know your marginal tax rate decreases significantly. Um, so that's you know it's it's going to be a positive. I know that's the big challenge we've been facing for. I guess, you know, over two, maybe three years now, um, just in terms of like a difficult, difficult environment for raising capital. So that that's definitely going to be a massive positive. So in terms of exchanges, rescheduling on its own, I don't think will prompt any U.S. exchanges to change their position because, you know, their view, if you talk to them, is they essentially want you to tell them we are fully in compliance with U.S. federal law, um, which and and and. Not so much of an emphasis on the Federal Foods and Drugs, Drugs and Cosmetics Act, sort of FDA regulations as they view it, but criminal law, uh, you know, around the Controlled Substances Act. So Schedule Three doesn't solve that issue because you're still not going to be in compliance with the Controlled Substances Act. You know, if you're operating a state permitted business, uh, but you know, I think there's some possibility you see a loosening of the exchanges. I mean, they've, they've already loosened up a lot despite their sort of stated position. Uh, and you see there's been a lot of ancillary companies that have successfully been listed um, on on NASDAQ, uh, less so on the New York Stock Exchange, but there are, there are some ancillary companies on the New York Stock Exchange. So, you know, it, it may provide a greater opening, but I think that's more of a, a medium term issue. Um, uplisting momentum, is sort of the same point, which is that, you know, for someone to uplist from, let's say the CSE to the Toronto Stock Exchange up in Canada, which would then permit you to cross list to NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange in the US, they're going to want compliance with federal law. So, you know, with some sort of notable exceptions that, you know, are pretty nuanced, we don't have to get into here. Uh, the US MSOs really have uh, not been able to en masse, you know, uplist and I, and I don't think that'll change immediately upon upon rescheduling um potential impacts on ancillary services like banking and insurance so this this one is um you know I would also add to this which goes to the potential impact on capital markets is you know I, Right now, right, one of the big challenges in cannabis is that, you know, you've got of the universe of potential capital that can be invested into businesses, only a certain portion of that capital is comfortable investing into cannabis. Uh, and of that universe, of we'll call it the p 
potential cannabis capital, a lot of these people have lost money or they're tapped out or, you know, they're saving their dry powder for their existing investments. So for, you know, a lot of new money to flow into the cannabis industry, you need that sort of pool of available cannabis capital to expand to be a broader percentage of the overall world of capital. Because, you know, the overall world of capital is enormous compared to what's been available for, for cannabis to date. Um, and of course, institutional capital is going to be skeptical of investing in a federally illegal business. You know, they tend to like ancillary plays, you know, the technology companies, as opposed to directly touching the leaf. But I, I think, you know, once the enthusiasm builds up around the industry again, you know, I think it's easier to override those concerns. And the move to Schedule 3, I think, will also assuage some percentage, not 100%. But some percentage of the people say, you know, we're not going to do a federal legal deal because we can tell them, hey, you know, it's moved to Schedule 3. The federal government's not cracking down anytime soon. Uh, we're, we're on the path to fixing this. Like you've seen actual action by the federal government. So I think that'll get some percentage of the people off the sidelines, which results in sort of more cash uh, for the industry. Um, you know, the banking problem. So, you know, I, I don't think it solves the payment processing issue, which in my mind is the biggest issue from a banking perspective, because there's plenty of banks that will work with cannabis companies right now. Um, but I do think that, you know, this is just one of these things, again, I think more short to medium term, as opposed to immediate, like 280E, but you could see the credit brand of credit card network say, you know, listen, the federal government's on board with this. Um, we're okay. And I realize I've talked more than my share. I'm sorry. No worries. There's a lot to unpack on the um, immediate business impacts, but thank you. And it's a great segue to, to Cassia to talk more about the business impacts and Cassia is in, in California, which is a, a leader in interstate commerce. So we'll turn it to her to chat interstate commerce and um, how it's Schedule 3 potentially. <laughs> A leader in potential would like to be a leader in interstate commerce or cannabis in the future, currently a leader in many other products. Um, sure, so there's a lot of questions in this category. I'm going to be fairly brief. Um, you know, in terms of interstate commerce itself, uh, de if you know, full descheduling, removing from the Controlled Substances Act is what we need to really open the door to interstate commerce. Um, listing of the plant under Schedule 3, um, it's still going to be classified as a controlled substance. So um, states would continue to be able to prohibit the interstate transfer. It's not going to be um, legal, you know, legally regulated by FDA um, at this point under um, the Federal um, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, excuse me. So um, there's not a, a clear path to uh, interstate commerce. However, and we'll talk a little bit um, in more detail in the next slide. There, you know, we anticipate that if rescheduling to Schedule Three does occur, um, potentially we get a new enforcement memo out of the Justice Department um, reacting to this change in status. And um, as as many of you know, under the you know now. Uh, no longer uh, technically effective, but still um, setting policy for the federal government coal memorandums. Um, it includes enforcement priorities of the federal government, including interstate commerce. So um, there's there's some speculation that the um, you know change to Schedule Three and um, the the federal government's you know continued downgrading of this as a sort of national issue. Um, and continued um, support of the state markets um, will have further, you know, further impacts to interstate commerce. Um, in terms of regulation by the FDA, um, you know, there's a lot of questions and concerns out there that, you know, cannabis, cannabis will only be available uh, if it moves to Schedule 3 in a pharmacy, that, you know, the state, state legal markets will effectively be shut down. Um, and, you know, it's from our perspective, those fears are, um, you know, not, not likely to be immediately realized. Uh, the FDA already has the right to enforce the 
the FDCA, the, the Drug and Cosmetic Act, for cannabis um, where it exists under Schedule 1 but lacks the resources to do, to do so or the desire to enforce. Um, they have not indicated that they will change their position uh, with respect to cannabis as a whole um, as it moves to Schedule 3, although certainly this is just another step in the evolution of the federal government's treatment of this plant. Most of the substances in Schedule 3 are drugs that are regulated by the FDA as such that have gone through clinical trials and, um, you know, are, are officially regulated under FDCA. Cannabis is very unique in that it is a plant, so it never fit very well under Schedule 1 and certainly shouldn't have been there. It doesn't really fit all that well under Schedule 3 either. Um, it would make more sense for its um, byproducts with medical efficacies that have gone through clinical trials like an Epidiolex to be listed in Schedule 3 um, instead of a plant. Um, so it's still going to be the odd man out um, to some extent in Schedule 3. And we can we anticipate that FDA will continue to sort of treat it as its own unique thing that's not um, necessarily a drug. Um, Congress will almost certainly pass some form of legalization to avoid a situation where cannabis is legal but not federally regulated. Looking forward, um, and you know, we think that the hope is that this step will ultimately lead us towards um, a, a, a situation where we have uh, more of an equitable um, policy towards um, looking at the impacts of the war of drugs on a whole. Um, acknowledging that Schedule 3 doesn't um, address those impacts and that this is kind of a preliminary step that Congress needs to, you know, look at and do more um, to address as there have been, you know, a number of bills currently pending that haven't been successful thus far in doing that. So we'll see what happens. Currently, they're not doing anything in the House. So um, uh, my guess is as good as yours on that. Uh, next slide, Guy. Uh, so I wanted to take a little bit deeper dive on the interstate commerce context because we are in California, um, as some of you listening may know, California, Washington, and Oregon, all state legal cannabis markets have passed um, laws essentially authorizing them to do business, um, the licensed cannabis operators within those states to do business with other um, other operators in state legal marketplaces that have sort of agreed to these intergovernmental agreements who are licensed, et cetera, um, provided that commercial cannabis activities on you know, both sides are lawful and licensed. Obviously right now they cannot do that legally under federal law. Well, they still won't be able to do it when cannabis is, if cannabis is rescheduled to schedule three. However, what's interesting, um, and, and we may see more things like this start to, to push forward um, in this realm where there's just continued um, deregulation under the federal level. Um, in California, the, the bill that um, you know, would approve these interstate commerce activities states that um, it, the activity can only take place if one of four conditions is met, one of which would be California's attorney general, uh, issuing an opinion that the state itself will not be at, quote, significant risk of federal enforcement action if the state were to authorize it. And to this point in 2023, uh, California's Attorney General Rob Bonta has been soliciting input on uh, from various organizations, both within and without uh, California, on, as to whether uh, the state would be at significant risk of federal enforcement action. Now, this is not to say that the op this is not the operators themselves. This is the state of California saying, if, would we be the subject of federal enforcement action? And the consensus is that there's no significant risk. So California is looking to the AG to issue this opinion. And if we get going back to um, the, the conversation about a new federal enforcement memorandum similar to the coal memos, saying that, you know, with the move to Schedule 3, there's, um, you know, new federal enforcement priorities. Cannabis is an even lower federal enforcement priority and perhaps even excluding interstate commerce um, from a list of specific concerns for the federal government. You know, there could be a pathway that even for state markets to essentially expand in their flaunting of federal prohibition and you know, potentially even find that they are willing to authorize um, limited interstate commerce transfers ahead of federal legalization. I have no idea if this will actually happen. 
Um, but it's interesting speculation, and it and it sort of is illustrative uh, illustrative of the the larger conversation around the the world of unknowns that we don't necessarily know how the scheduling rescheduling to schedule three could and impact the sort of larger world of a push towards the end of federal prohibition. Um, so some food for thought there, um, and I'll I'll turn it back over to Sean. Thanks, Cassia. I'm going to turn over to, to Brian here to talk about the impacts on criminal justice reform, which is, you know, obviously one of the most, if not the most important piece here and the, the core of Biden's stated intent in this whole process. So, Brian, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, the, the cannabis has been in this position since the 70s, since many people on this webinar maybe weren't even born. And now we're looking at that shift right 50 years later. So it's truly remarkable what's going on. Um, and I think we do have to, to echo some of the other panelists. It's incremental reform, right? Uh, everyone on on this on this side of the webinar certainly feels that uh, descheduling, right, not rescheduling, and then uh, decriminalizing at the federal level is really the end game, um, especially to accomplish criminal justice goals and social equity goals. But we kind of have to deal with what we have, and it is remarkable, and I'll, I'll sort of explain why. Um, so the backdrop here, I think, is, is worth noting in that, you know, when Biden set this into motion uh, almost a year ago today or very, very uh, close to that, you know, it, it, there were several criminal justice sort of pieces there, right? So he, he set HSS on, on their way to study this, but he also pardoned uh, 6,000 people or something like that for federal uh, possession of cannabis. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that's important. There's actually a difference between a pardon and an expungement. Uh, pardons are still on your record generally. They just say pardoned next to it, whereas an expungement actually deletes it from your from your record. But nevertheless, it's a positive step forward. And when he did that, he also said, hey, governors, you know, take my lead. We should take action on this. And in fact, a number of states uh, really jumped on that. Uh, Kentucky, Colorado, uh, Pennsylvania, some other state governors really kick-started programs to, to do mass expungements in their state. So there is a wave of criminal justice reform that I think has been set into motion by this, even if it's not you know, perfect in every way. Um, you know, Charlie hit upon this earlier, but the kind of big takeaway is that, you know, when and if you know, cannabis is moved to Schedule 3, it will uh, it, crimes around marijuana will still be subject to federal criminal enforcement, right? And that's basically because, you know, at the federal level, you have um, federal criminal code that says the word marijuana, right? It says there are certain crimes aligned, that are assigned to marijuana. It doesn't say there are certain crimes for Schedule 3 substances, right? So it's really not a giant pickup in that sense. Um, and that unfortunately filters down to the states and I'll explain that. However, I, I do think there's, you know, when and if this occurs, uh, there will be a, a large scale effect on what happens at the state level. And I think many people know that, you know, the vast majority of cannabis violations are um, registered at the state level. It's, you know, state criminal codes, local criminal codes. And, you know, I, I predict that we will see prosecutors and judges really looking at cannabis differently if this passes at the federal level. And my sort of story there is when we uh, legalized cannabis in Colorado in 2012, and I was, I was a big part of that, uh, we it was a question mark. We're like, well, are the feds going to do anything? You know, and as it turned out, almost instantaneously, the federal government and and our district dropped a bunch of cannabis cases, a bunch of criminal cannabis cases. They didn't have to because we just legalized it under state law, but they weren't tone deaf. They understood that uh, the you know the the winds were shifting on this, and and we've seen that in kind of you know a number of other states. There have been there's significantly less cannabis prosecutions, not only at the state level um, uh, when state laws change, but also um, by those AGs and those federal prosecutors. So I think there's a there's a powerful persuasive piece, and you know of course that's incredibly important in a state in a country that has the highest incarceration rate in the world and, and incarcerates over 200, 2 million of our citizens. You know, anything we can do here, especially around cannabis crimes, um, it would be important. So uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, you know, these trigger laws, this is you know, a question that's come up a bit. You know, a number of states, I think, in an effort to say, hey, we recognize the duality or the schizophrenia between these different state and federal laws and these different state and federal views on cannabis. We're going to go ahead and have these trigger laws under state law that work to harmonize uh, state criminal laws when the feds, when and if the feds take a take a different view on cannabis. Unfortunately, you know, I looked into this a bit, and and the the jury's a little bit out. But you, I looked at. Um, 
Texas, Michigan, Wisconsin, Washington State, they all have these kind of trigger laws. And they don't really seem to accomplish the goal of changing a ton in terms of, um, you know, having the state instantaneously uh, legalize cannabis uh, when the feds do or something like that, or, or even move it to schedule three. Um, and the reason for that is actually very similar to the reason that at the federal level, uh, which I mentioned earlier, at the, at the state level, there's just in general, not crimes that are assigned to schedule three substances. They're instead crimes that are assigned to marijuana, right? So it's, we're just going to have to act to change those state marijuana laws. Um, however, the major kind of shift that we're going to see here is around uh, 280E, which obviously Charlie spoke about what that would mean for, for businesses. But, um, you know, 280E as it stands, it, it, it is a felony, right, for uh, folks to... Um, engage in tax evasion around 280E. So uh, if cannabis, when this happens and when we move to Schedule 3, cannabis will no longer be subject to 280E from an economic standpoint, it'll no longer be subject to 280E from a criminal prosecution standpoint. So that, that I think, is a major sort of positive pickup. Uh, so, you know, sort of, in, in, I guess the last sort of piece there is, is, you know, we, we do believe this is part of a broader wave. We think the, you know, it's quite possible we'll see a new coal memo that sort of, you know, has some wind in its sails because of this statement by the federal government. And, um, you know, perhaps will lessen some of the prosecutorial um, uh, priorities of, of the Fed. So, you know, major persuasive and sort of policy shift here. And I think that will have a positive criminal justice effect. Some actual change via the, the 280E provision is, is sort of the summary there. Thank you. And that's a great segue into there's there's a lot of work ahead and you know obviously remarkable progress and the schedule 3 recommendation if accepted you know gets us significantly far down the field here towards ending prohibition and gives us a lot of the tools to to get to the end um but there's you know some really important next steps including of course getting through the DEA process work at the states and hopefully getting another um, enforcement memo and potentially another and potentially some enforcement guidance from from FDA as far as you know them not or them continuing their current non enforcement approach with respect to the FDCA on state markets. So we're going to go to the the next slide. Um, so I, I think this will undoubtedly and it already has um, you know had momentum brought momentum to Congress and passing cannabis reforms and you know our, our allies like Schumer have committed to you know taking the ball the rest of the way down the field towards removal um, of cannabis from full CSA control. And you know while the uh, you know rescheduling to something like three was the maximum achievable outcome in the administrative process, you know, given the standards HHS DEA um, must abide by its you know Congress has the power to amend the CSA, to reschedule, deschedule, change penalties, and, you know, move forward with vehicles that we've seen before, which, you know, some regulate like alcohol, um, you know, include legitimate social equity and criminal justice reform components and preserve state rights. And I think that we will see more support from Congress um, just by virtue of the fact that the federal government FDA has recognized the medical e efficacy and safety in that, you know, medical use, legitimate medical use, low potential abuse are supported by regulation. And that's what, you know, these state laboratories have shown. And I think, you know, by saying, okay, now that the federal government has acknowledged medical efficacy, I can get behind this now. We're just going to see a lot more support from both sides of the aisle and a lot of momentum um, in some of the, the states as well that'll drive forward some of these reforms. Um, so, you know, there's recent proposals that that we've where we've seen comprehensive reform like states, the Moore Act, um, others like one, two, three, and you know, other other bills supporting veterans research, um, of course, safer banking that I think will um, benefit from, from the momentum of Schedule Three. Um, and then of course Congress can continue to limit federal enforcement through appropriations as it's done for the past, as it's done in the past, um, it's possible we'll see, um, you know, protections for the adult use market in future appropriations. Um, but I think, you know, that's an important vehicle to watch as well. And as we've said, you know, it's expected that there could be sort of a coal 2.0 
enforcement memo um, that you know would be a continuation of um, the priorities set forth in Cole that are you know still still followed even though um, it's been rescinded and perhaps contain additional protections um, that have developed since then and um, you know like I said I think it's potential we see something from FDA but you know they have continued their policy of non enforcement with with cannabis and still with hemp even with hemp being federally legal you know they've made clear that they don't believe the FDCA is a fit, fitting vehicle for cannabis outside of the drug context and you know they don't have the desire or resources to enforce and, and nothing in the schedule three recommendation changes that um and i also think this will have tremendous momentum on the states and i'll, I'll turn it back to brian to um outline what that looks like yeah thanks sean and i do think yeah just staying with our theme of this being you know a adding momentum to the movement uh, i really think you know i've run state campaigns i really think voters will read news articles when the federal government shifts their position after 50 years and says cannabis is, you know, has medical efficacy, it's not the danger we thought it was. And I think that will impact the, the many state efforts that are going on to change state laws. So just a quick rundown as you know, our sort of big wins uh, for this movement in 2023 was, was Maryland, uh, really Maryland getting open, they legalized in 2022, and then Delaware, uh, which which uh, passed through the legislature there. Uh, and then, of course, anyone who's out there in Ohio or has friends in Ohio, that's on the ballot in, geez, I think just a month. Uh, and hopefully that will pass as well, which I think will get us the 24th state, if I'm not mistaken, to legalize cannabis. Um, so uh, in terms of 2024 and, and what states to kind of keep an eye on, and I do want to give a nod to my friends at the Marijuana Policy Project, who I sort of consulted on this and are, are key to movement in a lot of these states. But I think Hawaii has a, has a strong chance of legalizing uh, via their legislature. Um, New Hampshire is is taking a hard look at legalization and may have sort of a, oh, almost like a state-run liquor store model. Uh, so just pretty interesting how they're approaching it. Uh, Louisiana is looking to really, you know, the goal is to improve their medical law, which has, you know, not been robust, um, as well as push for recreational. And then I, I lost the slide, so now I just got to go off memory. Um, I think Pennsylvania was the final slide that, you know, we're looking at Pennsylvania in 2026. So a little ways out, but I think all these states will absolutely uh, look at the federal government and voters will say, "How? wow, okay, this, maybe it's time to rethink cannabis laws in our state because, because the federal government is rethinking cannabis laws too. Back to you, Shab. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll um, turn it over to some questions. And um, before I get to questions, I just want to emphasize that there, you know, is a lot of work left to do. And, you know, this is one of the most important times and, um, you know, are the, on the road here to, to support and to get organized and to get engaged and get educated. And um, as we've outlined, you know, there's work to do on an enforcement memo on making sure, you know, the DEA um, doesn't, you know, land in, in Schedule 2 for any reason. Um, you know, to make sure that the, the media and messaging around all of this is, is accurate and moves the ball forward. And importantly, to make sure that we take the next steps in, in Congress and in the states to, to really move towards descheduling and, and regulation and um, include, you know, legitimate criminal justice reform and social equity components. And um, the Coalition for Scheduling Reform has done a great job of, of organizing, um, you know, these, these next steps and um, there's many opportunities to support. So feel free to reach out to me or, you know, any of us. Um, if you go to the next slide, we'll put our, our contact information up. Um, if you're interested in getting involved or if you have any any questions on anything we talked about today or anything going forward, we're thrilled to, to be involved and be a resource here. And, um, you know, the success of the effort very much depends on the, the engagement of the, the industry. So um, I'll turn it over to some questions and um, we'll start with a few in the chat here. Um, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of good questions. Um, so if you operate on the state, on the illicit market, would you be subject to federal or state charges? Uh, the answer there is, is both. Um, and, you know, even if possession is, uh, 
is legal if you were operating commercially under Schedule 3, um, you would certainly be in violation of both federal and, and state charges, depending on your state. Um, I can't see the Q&A section. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, how will rescheduling affect advertising rules for cannabis companies and media organizations that sell advertising? Great question, and um, you know, definitely feel free to chime in, panelists. Here, I think that it will, you know, allow more companies to advertising, or sorry, potentially lessen some rules, but much depends on what comes in an enforcement memo. I think it's likely that, you know, enforcement priorities around not distributing marijuana to to minors and not advertising to minors, you know, could still stay the same. And those are, you know, fundamental in various states. So I think some of the advertising rules that are built around that um, will remain, but, you know, perhaps the the lower scheduling could could lessen some of those rules. I think mean, it's important to note that the state the state programs and the state regimes and all of their regulations will will be unaffected by this. They're going to stay in full force and effect with respect to who will advertise cannabis. So there's there's not going to be an immediate change in you know regulation or even you know cannabis policy as a whole um, from the except for this rescheduling. Um, in terms of premium publishers, um, you know, there's been uh, there's a there's a reluctance to uh, advertise because of you know various provisions to the Controlled Substances Act um, involving you know um, ancillary uh, aiding and abetting of illegal activity. Um, I think that those analyses could prospectively change. So um, you know, it's. It, under Schedule 3, it's still going to be in an interesting, cannabis is still going to be in an interesting position because it's not regulate, it's not a drug, um, but it's under Schedule 3. So there'll still be some some gray area and some, you know, interpretations and policy, but um, I think it'll continue to open up advertising as a whole. And <clears throat> sorry, if you meant if I jump in, because I think I can actually uh, cover with this question as well, a couple, uh, quite a few that have also come up. Um, to piggyback on, on what Cassia said, also as far as state legal operators go, um, with the move to Schedule 3, it's not really going to change anything about operating illegally um, as they are now. Because as a few questions asked, for a Schedule 3 operator to comply with Schedule 3 and treaty obligations, as I mentioned, DEA's regulations are still going to require that those operators register with the DEA in order to be compliant under Schedule 3 as a Schedule 3 operator. So pretty much all the same requirements as far as registering with DEA, ensuring that your facility is up to the, their code, um, prescriptions, doctor recommendations, um, all of those are going to still basically be what they are now. So a state legal operator is not just, once this moves to Schedule 3, is not just all of a sudden going to be um, able to comply with federal law because of the scheduling. They'll still have to get registered with DEA to be a compliant operator. Great point. Thank you. I'll take, I'll take a question from, from Dave Bass. Thanks for, for joining, Dave. Great to see you. Um, this is one that a lot of people have asked, would Schedule 3 make it so cannabis patients need an actual prescription? Um, the answer is most cannabis patients that are patients under state medical cannabis programs would not need a, a true you know, uh, prescription. Um, and that's because they would still be likely be operating under state programs. Um, for prescribed cannabis, you know, like an Epidiolex, like a Maribel, those drugs have to be FDA approved and nothing in this Schedule 3 recommendation um, meant FDA approval for, you know, cannabis flower or most of the products still on the market. So the real determiner and whether a product would be prescribed by a doctor and sold in the pharmacy is, is you know, whether there's a marijuana approved drug. Um, and I'd expect, you know, patients operating under um, 
state medical cannabis programs would, would proceed as they as they do now under the, the various rules of the state. And Jason, I'll kick this one to you. How long does the DEA have to complete their, their review? Um, so there's no actual set timeline here. The timeline in the statute is really related to a, a new drug that is uh, HHS is requesting being scheduled. So uh, there is a, a world where DEA could just kick this can down the road and just continuously do so. Um, again, politically, uh, we don't think that that is likely. Uh, we, we do think that a decision will be made, um, but there really is no set time frame for the, the final rule to be published. Thank you. That one is um, commonly asked as well. And kind of a related question, does the content of the HHS analysis matter as much as the recommendation to reschedule or at all? I mean, I think it depends on how DE or what DEA relies on when making its scheduling decision. If it decides not to move uh, mar marijuana into Schedule 3 and does so under the treaty um, exclusion or exception, then I don't think what's contained within the recommendation would be as important. However, if they say that uh, marijuana has uh, high potential for abuse or has um, no medical efficacy, then definitely what is contained is going to be important because DEA is required to accept HHS's recommendation as to medical and scientific matters. Thank you. Um, I think a question, if the rescheduling decision is challenged in court, what is the venue? And if struck, would that still allow for congressional rescheduling? I think on the, the second piece, yes, Congress still has the, the authority to move forward um, with rescheduling, you know, despite any, any recommendation or no recommendation at all um, from, from the administration or, or from uh, HHS and DEA. Um, I'd have to confirm what what federal venue would would be the decision would be the uh the venue if it was challenged. If I can get back to you on that. Um a couple of questions here on hemp, which is you know interesting timing wise, we are coming up upon the next farm bill and you know a lot of a number of congressional efforts to um regulate finished products, including high THC hemp and to Patrick's question, what has changed with cannabis since DEA's last review that gives us hope that they will approve Schedule 3? Um, I think, you know, one thing is the the approach they they took with Epidiolex, where, you know, they um, acknowledged the, the medical efficacy and abuse, lower abuse potential that justified rescheduling and then descheduling, and then, you know, looked at how they could add regulations to, to meet both their domestic and, and treaty obligations. Um, but there's, it's possible that FDA did consider state data here in medical use. We haven't seen the letter, which I think was another question. Um, so I think you know many folks are interested to know, um, you know what, what data did they, they look at um, to make their determination as to you know, the medical, medical, medical use and low potential for abuse. Um, so how would Schedule 3 impact the 2018 Farm Bill and the recent wave of state regulations on intoxicating hemp? Um, you know, it, it if it de or sorry reschedules cannabis to Schedule 3, there would have to be an amendment to the CSA with respect to the definition of hemp, because right now hemp is fully descheduled along with the you know deriv derivatives and extracts that are derived from hemp. So if accepted, you know, cannabis and its derivatives would be schedule three and hemp and its derivatives would still remain not scheduled. And I think until there's finished product regulation on intoxicating hemp, um, you know, the the wave of state regulatory you know, many, many FDAs is going to continue. I think we can expect to see congressional efforts for finished product regulation, at least for CBD and low THC hemp next year, and certainly efforts in the farm bill um, to, you know, direct 
finished product regulation and potentially, you know, limit the definition of hemp. But it, you know, it will be interesting to see how all of those things in interact. Um, Let's get a couple of questions on with Schedule 3, will LPs be able to import into the US if they go through the DEA registration process? Yeah. Yeah, so basically the import export of marijuana when uh, state legal operators would still not be able to participate in that unless they went through the DEA registration process. So again, with the treaties, uh, obligation of the treaty is that a single agency control the import export of marijuana. And so DEA would still require registration and uh, approval of that permit. So again, wouldn't change state legal operators ability to participate. Okay, I'll throw this one to the group. Do you anticipate any changes, relaxation to marijuana product testing and seed to sale requirements, or will these continue to be left to the states? I don't think there's any intent with this that the state frameworks will be impacted. Now, over time, if you know if there if there is an environment where interstate commerce becomes a reality ahead of federal legalization, which is probably unlikely, but you know, there seems to be some states willing to push the envelope, then it would in turn, I think, wag the tail of some of the regulations of seed to sale and and that sort of thing. But I don't think the federal policy is um you know is going to look or or in, involve itself with the state legal marketplaces. And I think they want the state legal marketplaces to continue to exist. There's no desire on behalf of the federal government to, um, you know, end the state legal marketplaces as part of this um, initial, you know, rescheduling the lease. Quite the opposite, I think. <laughs> they don't want more responsibility. Yeah, I agree. And to kind of one, one last question, you know, Cliffs, in the in the case of rescheduling, don't we expect FDA to establish some some testing guidelines with efficacy and safety? Um, you know, I I I think we can expect, you know, potentially they could issue some sort of um, you know, enforcement priority memorandum, sort of like the coal memorandum for an FDA perspective. Or do something like they've done with hemp, where they've been hands off, but issued, you know, some FAQs and informal guidance, you know, emphasizing, you know, what they do see, what they do see is, you know, public safety issues where they do want to enforce. And, you know, in the context of hemp, we've seen and other products where that, you know, they've made unlawful or egregious claims, you know, or products contain, um, you know, extremely high levels of THC marketed to children. Um, and I, I expect that could continue with FDA, but I don't think they have, you know, the the resources or desire to regulate cannabis and disrupt the state markets otherwise. And they haven't done so, you know, with the marijuana market now, where there are, um, you know, different safety sta testing standards in, in every state. But um, you know, perhaps that could mean, um, you know, businesses need to be more cautious with respect to to claims and marketing to children and things we know are their safety priorities. Um, thanks, great, great questions, everyone. And if we didn't get to it, um, feel free to, to shoot us an email and we're happy to answer and we will provide the slides. Um, and we are at the hour and I really appreciate everyone's time and engagement and look forward to further discussions as we progress here. Thanks to all my wonderful colleagues as well. <laughs>